And now, from the left coast, another in-depth interview from Peter B. Collins. Peter B.'s been talking about news and politics since Watergate and generously shares his knowledge, wisdom, opinions, and outrage here because his friends and family can't take it anymore. Peter B.'s an independent progressive who upsets Democrats and Republicans as conditions require and is one of the few lefty pundits who predicted Trump would win. This podcast is funded entirely by listeners like you, and subscribers get first access to these in-depth interviews. When you're ready, go to peterbcollins.com forward slash sign up. Now, here's your humble host, Peter B. Collins. Thanks for downloading the very latest in-depth interview podcast here at peterbcollins.com. This one is highly recommended for the turbulent times we find ourselves in. Dr. Justin A. Frank, the psychiatrist who wrote Trump on the Couch, returns to our program today with comments about the current state of Trump. Every day is an endless train. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you who support my work by taking out little subscriptions at peterbcollins.com. And today I want to just thank two people who subscribe. One is Ford Green, who gets a prominent role in today's show for introducing me to the concept of narcissistic supply. And the other is our longtime supporter out in the middle of Indiana, Rex Wetzel, who just renewed his subscription by mail. And he loves to talk about how he is a blue dot in a sea of red. Thanks for listening, and feel free to share this podcast all over the place. Today on the Peter B. Collins podcast, the return of psychiatrist Justin A. Frank. He's based in Washington, D.C. He's the author of three, three books, Bush on the Couch, Obama on the Couch, and Trump on the Couch. And I feel like I need a little therapy at this crucial time. Every day is an endless train. how Trump does it, always making himself the center of the issue of the moment and demanding your attention as only a narcissist can. Justin That's A. Right. Frank, thank you for joining me today and uh, offering some advice to Americans, some insights about uh, this president and the moment that we are in. I always enjoy our conversations. Well, before we start, or now that we're starting, I want to say that that goes likewise for me. And I always feel after we speak, I wish we spoke more frequently, because after we speak, I always feel like I gain a few IQ points uh, <laughs> from you and from our conversation. So it's always, uh, it's very good and stimulating. So let's get going and we can see uh, <clears throat> what we can produce between us. Today. All right, Dr. Frank. Well, uh, I want to begin. I have a friend who is not a medical professional. He's a, a lawyer, and his name's Ford Green. And in a Facebook post a few weeks back when the uh, public meetings and the gatherings were uh, ordered reduced, uh, he noted that Trump had lost his uh, the lifeline to his mob rallies that he hosts all over the place. He never stopped campaigning when he uh, was installed in the White House. And right. uh, Ford refers to this as narcissistic supply. And he was worried that the president was going to be undernourished and his narcissism would, uh, you know, flame up, flare up. Uh, and it, it appears that once he put Mike Pence in charge, kind of making him the fall guy for the bungled response to coronavirus, he decided that he wanted to revive the White House press room and make it a new area of dominance so he could reach out to the nation 
and uh, be the stern father and the angry president uh, that he presents on a daily basis. So you might know more about this in uh, psychological and psychiatric theory. Uh, Is narcissistic supply a thing? Yeah, it is a thing. But I wanted to say before we go any further, what you just said in your last sentence uh, doesn't fit with narcissistic supply because you said he wanted to reestablish himself as the stern father. And I think a narcissistic supply is you want to reestablish yourself as beloved, Hmm. admired, yearned for, appreciated by others. A narcissistic supply is something that helps you feel better about yourself. So even though he may have wanted in a way to establish himself as a stern father, I think that he wanted the he wanted an audience and it, it might have even included, I thought, uh, wanting people to even criticize him because at least he'd get a rise out of people and he would get angry, but he would also be connected. He needs to be connected to other people. A narcissistic supply I mean, Narcissus died from starving to death. It's not just that he fell in the water to drown. He was looking at himself in the mirror for so, in the water reflection for so long, uh, he forgot to eat. So the narcissistic supply was just seeing his face. So what Trump needs to do is see his face reflected in other people who adore him and admire him. So he also, he had this wall of people in his press conferences yeah. in the last two weeks, but they were all singing his praises before they said anything. They were saying, oh, you're so great, you've done so much. It was really unbelievable and pretty dumb. And he was also singing his own praises. Nobody's ever done what I've done. One commentator on TV said, I'm amazed his arm isn't falling off from scratching his own back so much. (laughs) Um, So narcissistic supply is what actors do, what singers do. Look at what's happened to all the comedians. They don't have an audience. Stephen Colbert doesn't go on. Uh, All these great people are uncomfortable just talking uh, to an empty house. And as much as we think, you know, they're talking to all of us on TV, they really connect to their audience. So Trump is not alone in that need for narcissistic supply. Anybody who is in the public eye and does the kinds of things that a president does gets narcissistic supplies. The thing is that Trump has never been admired or even liked by the press because he's uh, he's he's abrasive and difficult and uh, not that smart. So he has a lot of uh, strikes against him. But what he's done with the people who love him is his audience is really a lot like, you know, Judy Garland's office audience. She had a narcissistic supply mm-hmm. of people who adored her, and she came alive when she went on stage. And it's really like you could watch her, like in that movie, Uh, where the guy says it's showtime. I think it was uh, whatever it's called. But it's the Renee Renee Zellweger movie from last year. Yes, and the guy comes out and he says, it's showtime, Bob Fosse. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's about uh, the idea that you are really sort of a husk until you become on stage and then you become very much alive. Now, you made a point that uh, really resonated with me, because whenever I watch these uh, staged presentations, uh, you know, they had to dust off the White House press room because ever since Sarah, the liar, what's her name, Huckabee Sanders left, uh, it's been dark in there. And uh, he always is, is very conscious of being a TV producer, the human wallpaper that uh, stands behind him. Uh, so that the the still photo that is taken for a newspaper shot uh, shows him flanked, you know, by his uh, his loyal supporters, uh, and as you point out, they're all required to genuflect and yes, to... and that is narcissistic supply. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that's what we. That's what it is. It's like having and and the problem with people like him. I don't know if it's true of Colbert, but it's the problem of people like him is they didn't have enough of it when they were kids. Mm -hmm. I don't think he felt very loved by either of his parents. Uh, His mother was very busy paying attention to herself and her uh, 
had the queen of England and her gold and her getting money and her, she was very excited about marrying a rich guy from coming from terrible, pardon me, poverty in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And the father was busy building his business and uh, making a lot of money. And he was grooming the older son uh, to be the successor. But one thing about narcissistic supply that I wrote about in the book, I didn't use that term, was that at one point within the first year of his being in office, uh, his son Baron had a visitor from New York, from the school in New York for a birthday party. And Baron took the friend and the friend's mother around the to show him around after the cake was cut. And they went into a room in the Oval Office, on the side of the Oval Office, and there was his father, Trump, sitting there eating a burger or whatever, watching himself on The Apprentice. Yeah, wow. Now, that is narcissistic supply. And it's so interesting because the person he watched was a character, but the character looked like him, had the same name as him, so he thought it was actually him when it was actually a character because he was so heavily edited to be on that show uh, because the, the producers of the show couldn't possibly get him to stay on point and stay uh, uh, within his uh, guardrails as what his job was in the show that they had to just do massive editing to get him on the show and appear coherent. Well, but you know, course, I, I only watched that show once, uh, Dr. Frank, and... I noted that he appeared at the beginning and the end, and the right. rest of it was just uh, his his uh, competitors, you know, who were knifing each other in the back and scheming to exactly. gain his approval. They had to do that because they couldn't have him on during the show. He was not able to stay focused, and they had to have the show. They had to tape the show, otherwise they would have been busy picking up pieces all day, all week long for each show from him. Mm -hmm. He's not possible. He can't be corralled. So that's the first thing. So narcissistic supply is a supply of admirers. One of the things about a narcissistic supply that's important is that it protects the narcissist from the pain of being alone and from an empty feeling that uh, he needs other people. In other words, if you're getting a narcissistic supply, you don't feel that you need the supply. You feel that they need you. You do a flip. So you project your own envy and hunger into the fans, and they're the ones who are hungry for you. So you don't have to face your own emptiness, your own hunger, your own need. And that's why narcissistic supply is so essential. There's an old, uh, an old Neil Young song. Uh, I, I can't remember the exact title of the song, but it's on an album called On the Beach. And he sings, I need a crowd of people, but I can't face them day to day. <laughs> That's right. And, and Trump, Trump can't either. Well, but, but he, he enjoys... Part, of, part me. of not being able to face them day to day is that they'll eat him alive. Right. And because he, he, he has... excites such hunger in the crowd because he's so amazingly charismatic. Trump is not, to me, as charismatic at all, but, I mean, to the people who love him, he is. He excites such excitement that they really, you know, it's like at a rock concert. They want a piece of the action. Um, <clears throat> and Neil Young was aware that he couldn't take it every day because it's too much. Yeah. And you also have to be on all the time. Mm -hmm. So Trump needs his downtime, too, which is usually with hamburgers or in his office or calling friends on the phone or sitting on the toilet. God knows what he does. He watches During Foxy his, Friends. He watches Fox and Friends. Yes, all of it. <laughs> so that's that's what narcissism supplies. So it is a, uh, it's not in the psychoanalytic uh, canon, per se, but mm -hmm. it's very well uh, used and meaningful and understood by other analysts. It's, it's a very much of a needing a parental substitute. And one of the things that happens in his rallies is there's a reverberation back and forth, as I was saying. He gets fed, they get fed, they take turns supplying each other because people who go to his rallies, like I was just saying to you, I get some narcissistic supply from you when I feel smarter at the end of an interview. I enjoy our conversation. Hopefully it's not pathological on my part. I don't think it is, no. but it's part of life, but and it's part of entertainment life. But for him, it's essential. He cannot function without it. Now, this is an opportunity for him to really present a different persona, to be 
uh, a presidential character to offer right. some empathy, to uh, try to lead people in a positive way and solve problems. And, and yes. you know, some of that, not the compassion, but, you know, his executive background, I wouldn't call them skills, but his background, you know, allows him to bark out orders and try to tell people what to do and all that. But he is so compulsive about protecting his persona uh, that he has to lash out at the media. And last Friday, when that NBC reporter pitched him a softball, you know, what do you say to people who are afraid? He said, well, you're a bad reporter. That's a lousy question. And his anger uh, and and his pettiness just overtakes him. And this okay. this compulsive need to always present himself as perfect uh, really gets in the way of earning respect from from the public in a time of crisis. At a deep level, I don't know how far to delve in here, but I will try. At a deep level, when a person's narcissistic supply is inadequate, the person feels empty and hollow. Then the person feels anxious about needing an audience and needing a supplier. So he gets annoyed and angry and envies the very people, he's like biting the hand that feeds him, he envies the very people who give him what he needs because he realizes at some level he can't live without them. So what he's done is projected or evacuated his need into the audience. But when there is no audience, the next move for a person like that is to become paranoid because they put their neediness and they feel humiliated by having so much need and they feel ashamed and weak and that they're going to be attacked for having these needs. So they misperceive their experiences. His experience was that Peter Alexander was attacking him because Trump became paranoid. It was he was unable to see the, hear the praise or the need for him to say something positive because by then, if a narcissistic person is not getting his supplies, which by then it was clear that he wasn't, no rallies, he couldn't even leave to play golf. If he's not getting his supplies, underneath narcissism lies paranoid anxiety. And in fact, the deepest levels here are that even grandiosity is a compensatory feeling to compensate for paranoid anxiety about need, about vulnerability, and about hating the people who can give him something that he can't give himself, because he can't make his own supplies of narcissism. He tries, he keeps talking about what a great job he's doing. I'm the best, I did this, and I did this, and look at what I've done. And then he gets other people to praise him, but he needs the emotion, which you only get at a rally, which you only get with a group who really loves you as opposed to goes through the emotions of praising you. His narcissistic supply was gone. And when he needs it, he then envies and hates the fact that somebody else can do something for him that he can't do for himself. All the self-love in the world doesn't work. He has to have his name plastered all over the world on Trump hotels. He has to see himself in every mirror. He can't stand it if people ignore him. So when he's away from those people, he folds and he gets very paranoid. And one of the things that a narcissist does is they hate needing other people, but they get other people to need them. And then it's OK because they have a mutual feeding society or a feeding frenzy at these rallies where he gets his needs met. The audience gets their needs met back and forth. But without the audience, he's nothing. And when he's nothing, he hates needing something from somebody else. He can never ask for help. He can never appear vulnerable because it's too dangerous. He'll be attacked. He'll be humiliated. And that's his core conflict. So, so he becomes destructive in reaction to that. So uh, I lot. see at least an irony. I gave you an earful. But, no, no, no. Uh, I see an uh, irony, if not a potential metaphor here, 
that yeah. his need for this narcissistic supply uh, is is uh, uh, in the the situation here where he's unable to provide the supply of necessary yes. medical equipment, ventilators, uh, federal money, uh, all the things that he is unable to deliver. And uh, it, it seems he's that he's hollow. He's empty. He cannot. That's right. He cannot supply things without somebody to receive it. So if somebody says, "We'll let you do this," nationalize the industry, provide this, provide that. He feels emptied by that, more emptied. He doesn't feel the gratitude and the excitement and the thrill of having the ventilators look. Uh, they should each have the name Trump on them um, <laughs> because he doesn't feel full. So he's not able to give. He can only give false things. He can only give this pseudo love promises about the future Nothing is really substantial, and everybody just eats it up, and they go back and forth. I'm so, sorry, I cut you off a little bit, but I think that's what you're talking about. So he's not able. Yeah, he's not able to give those things. It's not just that he's greedy in terms of money and wants to privatize things. That's true, and it's not that. But he hates getting something from someone else that he can't do on his own. So if you accept. Uh, the testing from the World Health Organization, it means you're accepting that somebody else can do something that you can't. That is unacceptable to him. He can do everything. He has the best words. He has the best language. He has the best understanding of science. He has the best military leader. He's the tall. He's everything. He can't stand that there's something missing. And there's a lot missing. So just today, we're speaking on March 24th. Uh, he's shit-tweeting uh, Governor Cuomo of New York. Uh, the New York Times reports that Trump has been watching Cuomo's own news conferences on a daily basis, scheduling his own uh, so that they don't conflict. And Cuomo, in a, uh, a somewhat uh, uh, pathological interview with his little brother on CNN last night, where they... They alternated between, you know, good faith exchanges about uh, the topic at hand and also uh, uh, an obvious sibling rivalry that was going back and forth throughout the interview. Uh, at Between any, the brothers, yeah. yeah at, at any rate, uh, you know, Trump apparently watched that because the governor was complaining that he needs 30,000 ventilators and, he, the, you know, the government sent him 400. And – you know, Trump is now uh, attacking Andrew Cuomo, uh, who has, I thought, uh, almost debased himself in trying to avoid criticism of the president and trying to, you know, put together some sort of working relationship with the White House in the interest of his constituents. Uh, and that's not enough for Trump, who has to pound on him for criticizing him in public. Well, what was he attacking him for exactly? Uh, for, you know... He, Saying he wasn't giving him enough ventilators. Right, and Trump claims that, you know, there are more on the way in this mythical pipeline and that, uh, you know, Cuomo is out of line. Right. What happens is that Trump cannot accept his own hunger and his own need, just what I've been saying this whole time. One of the ways people deal with that failure is they project it to get rid of it. So they don't experience themselves as needing. Cuomo is able to say, I need this. I need you. I need ventilators. He's a healthy leader. A healthy leader is able to say, I need this. Trump is not a healthy person. He can't say, I need this. So what happens is he attacks Cuomo for criticizing him when Cuomo is actually maybe trying not to criticize him, but just saying, this is what I need, Mr. President. Nationalize the fucking industry, pardon my French, but get those things. But I need them. I need you. He can't stand that. He can't. He wants to be needed when there's an interaction, but not when there's something concrete that he has to produce because he can't. He's empty. He can only feel strong when he feels that somebody else really that there's a reverberation and they both feel increased. He is essentially feeling that Cuomo is more 
able. I had a patient once who was like Trump, who was one of the toughest cases I ever worked with, let me tell you. But at one point, he said, my patient, I envy a beggar who's able to ask for a cup of coffee on the street because I can't do that. That's Trump. He can't ask for anything. So when somebody else is strong enough, like Cuomo, to ask for something, he's not threatened by having to ask. He knows he needs these things. It's part of what they need in the state. He just says it. That Trump drives Trump crazy. He feels attacked. He feels belittled. He fe he knows he can't produce things because he can't ever say that he needs something. And he can't pull the trigger on nationalizing industry because that would also involve a need, even though usually a person who nationalizes something would be in charge of it. Are you still there? Oh, oh my yeah. God. Yeah, we're still here. <clears throat> You're just so getting another call. I'm getting another call. Well, I will decline it with great uh, ease. I just <laughs> did. Okay. Uh, so it's a big problem with Cuomo. He envies Cuomo. Cuomo is a strong leader who is organized and who can say what he doesn't have. He doesn't just promise shit. He says, this is what we have to deal with. This is what's going to happen. I need this. I need that. We're doing... Trump could never say any of those things. He can promise things, but he never says he needs something. He always says, this is how great I am. This is what I've done, and this is what I can do. And all of that is he's providing what's missing, which is what we started today with. He's providing his own narcissistic supplies. And I would add so, that, that Cuomo has uh, good hair, doesn't have to paint his face well, orange. <laughs> right. That's All of those things are also true. And, and he's got, uh, he's uh, 10 years younger, too. And he can so, talk in complete sentences and be rational. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, he's got all of those things. But what happened was the night before, the same night that there was that interview, when Trump had that uh, press conference last night, I don't know if you remember the, the, when uh, uh, Dr. Bricks, the woman, was talking, and he said, I have a question for you. I don't know if you remember, if you watched that. I didn't. And, yeah, it was unbelievable. He says, we have, here's my question. He says, we have a lot of very angry media all around this room. And they want one of these seats because everybody was separated. But they want one of these seats because of social distancing. We're keeping them empty. Will there ever be a time, he says to her, when all those really angry, angry people who didn't like me much in the first place, now they really don't like me, will they ever be able to be there in, so the seats are full? I thought when he said that, it wasn't only a paranoid attack on everyone. It was also a very interesting clue, which is that he needs his enemies. Yeah. He needs people because a paranoid, when you're projecting things, you're incomplete because you project and get rid of parts of yourself. So you have to have the person into whom you project around. So it's almost like he had to have the media that attacked him around him to feel complete. When he's with people who love him, he has to have them around to feel complete. It's all about feeling complete for something that's missing. Well, and I'd like you to expand a little bit more about projection because it is his M.O. In yes. every case where he you know, goes on Twitter and attacks people, uh, it, it's very clear, even for an amateur like me, to see that he is practicing projection, and he's that's pretty right. damn good at it. He's very, he's, it's second nature. Uh, everybody, projection is a very early defense uh, that have to, has to do with protecting against anxiety about facing, taking responsibility for doing something bad or for being bad in some way. So you project your anger, your aggression, anything into the other person. My brother made me do it. So-and-so did this. He pushed me, whatever it is. Those are all projection. Projection is an unconscious process where you are not aware of it, but you it's like the, the, the famous saying, the pot calling the kettle black. You actually accuse the other person of a quality that you have disavowed unconsciously, and then you beat them up. 
for having that quality. That's what bullies do. Bullies are afraid of being weak. They're afraid that they can't stand up to the other person. So they project their own weakness and then they beat the other person up for being weak and make them feel weaker and weaker and weaker. Let me give you and a recent allows- example in, in a, uh, I think it was on CNN, a town hall meeting where they kind of gave him equal time because all the Democratic candidates have done town halls with them. And right. this was in Pennsylvania, staged in uh, the town where Joe Biden was born. Right. <laughs> and a, a gentleman uh, got to ask a question, and, and he was very respectful. He, you know, he kissed Trump's ass first and declared that, you know, he had voted for him and uh, supports him. And then he said kind of uh, tentatively, but the tweets, he said— do you really have to attack Maxine Waters and accuse her of having a low IQ? And he immediately went into this this projection mode where it was because she had attacked him and that he can't allow that and he will always fight back. And, and he just, you know, basically ignored the basis of the question, a very friendly one, uh, and the damage that he does to his own constituents, uh, his own base, when he acts out in this manner. That's right. That is exactly him. And I think that one of the things uh, about Maxine Waters that right away you can see his projection is when he calls her dumb. That's a projection at the start because he's the one who's dumb. He's the one who doesn't get things. He has part of his projection involves what I call a defensive use of contempt He projects the part of himself that he doesn't like and has to disavow, that he can't answer a question. He can't think about the things. He even in his press conference yesterday called Iowa a country and Nebraska or Oklahoma a country, not even a state. I mean, he's not able to really function very well. So he's going to project his own dumbness and then accuse her of being dumb. It is a retaliation, but basically he is projecting, when he says he has to protect himself against attack, he is the original attacker. He always used to beat up weaker kids at school. He even hit teachers in the second grade. Um, And in one of his books that actually has not been reprinted, I don't know why, but maybe because of this stuff, in uh, in 2011, he wrote this book, and he has this statement about uh, paranoia is crucial to success, I'm quoting. Now, that sounds terrible, he said, but you have to realize that people, sadly, sadly, are very vicious. You think we're so different from the lions in the jungle, he asks. That's how he sees the world. It's, it's lion eat lion, dog eat dog. So he feels that the world is full of enemies who are out to get him. Those are all projections of his own aggression. He's, this is the most powerful man in the world right now. He's the president of the most powerful country. For a while, until last year, he had both houses of Congress in his pocket, plus the courts. And yet he feels embattled and attacked, demeaned by the press, belittled by the press. All of that is about paranoid anxiety. All of that is a long-standing consequence of denying his own murderousness and having to see it only as reactive that when he's attacked, he attacks back. But he's the one who invites the attacks. He's the one who creates his enemies. It's true that paranoids have enemies, but paranoids make enemies. And that's what he's done. Alexander was not his enemy when he asked that question. He made him an enemy. So that's my response about that. And that is about narcissism. And it's about what happens when there's a missing narcissistic supply. Um, And a person, and so one of the things that makes him grandiose and narcissistic like the Messiah is that he feels only he can save us. Only he can make us whole. Therefore, he can't get help from World Health Organization. He can't get help from other people. He can't even get help from Dr. Fauci. He can't really get it. He can't allow 
an expert to be able to say things he doesn't. Remember that interview he did just a week or two ago when he was visiting the CDC in the South, and he was telling people that his uncle was at MIT, and he's the smartest person ever, and I understand all these things, and everybody knows. I understand epidemiology and about virology. It was unbelievable. It was psychotic, I have to say. Yeah. What's he talking about? That's what he has to do. So it's all narcissistic compensation for a paranoid anxiety and for feeling empty inside. Even, uh, what's his name, the uh, guy he fired, uh, that tall guy from the, the from district attorney. I want to say Cuomo, but it's oh, not. Oh, no, you're thinking of uh, the FBI director. Yeah. James Comey. James Comey. Right. Comey too too tall Jimmy. One of his, yeah, in one of his interviews, he said that he never met a more empty person in his entire life. He just said it, and he's not a psychoanalyst. He just looked at him and he said, this is an empty man. Ugh. <laughs> Doctor, let me shift to uh, the, the other big thread that I see, aside from projection, and that is his posture as a victim of yes. so many different forces. And yes. to illustrate this, I want to uh, uh, just share with you and my listeners an exchange I had on Facebook last weekend. And oh. one of my so-called Facebook friends, uh, I don't even know the guy, but I somehow became connected with him. We'll call him Troy because that's his name. Uh, he posted a piece of propaganda from a website called WeLoveTrump.com. And okay. all we need to know is the headline, science experts quietly admit Trump's actions are saving lives during coronavirus epidemic. Now, right. we know this is flatly untrue. So right. I, I wrote, what's sicker, this campaign propaganda or the idiots who believe it? Trump's denial and deflection delayed the response. His attempt to con the public into believing it's no big deal may seem credible to Troy, but investors don't believe it. And almost every time he talks about it, the market drops even lower. I have a relative on ICU, or he's in ICU on a ventilator, near death from the virus, and you are enabling his deadly arrogance? He ignored the scientists in January and February, and you post this excrement that quotes a dubious science expert praising Trump. And right. I closed with, have you no shame? So he replied, <clears throat> great, everything is Trump's fault. In fact, blame him for the H1N1 virus, too. He wasn't the president, but who cares? Almost forgot. He is racist, too. Please don't watch the interviews with the Surgeon General, because that would not fit the narrative. A couple things. We had the lowest unemployment numbers ever, highest stock market ever, increase in manufacturing, new and better trade deals signed. I mean, this is all just Trump talking points. And somehow Trump is the reason for the stock market drop when he talks. There is a thing called TDS. And that's Trump derangement uh, syndrome. Have you called out China for this current virus, he asks? <laughs> and then he, he drops into a compassionate mode. He says, I hope your friend and others affected get healthy and make a full recovery. I hope you stay safe and healthy. Take care, Peter. <laughs> right. So uh, my central point is here he is reflecting the victimization, using the exact language that his dear leader uses. And he, he actually, and some of his friends, refer to the president as our dear leader. And they don't really recognize that that's what North Koreans are forced to call Kim Jong-un. That's right. Um, sometimes my friends call me the dear leader when I insist on going to a certain restaurant for dinner. <laughs> but uh, we'll leave that aside. Well, my, my aside is I refer to Trump frequently as our dear tweeter. Our dear tweeter. That's even better. <laughs> well, the, the issue is that part of justifying aggression and justifying being greedy and self-important, one of the justifications is the feeling that you're being attacked. Trump always said when he first ran in 2016 that the election is rigged. He was getting ready to lose. That itself may have been a projection for all we know, and that he may have been the one who knew that he was rigging the election or that Russia was rigging the election. That's very possible that even that was a projection. 
But the, the, the idea of being a victim, the person who responded to you in Facebook is very hard to deal with because they didn't address what you were saying. Right. You were not blaming Trump for everything. Right. You were talking about a big problem we have. You were definitely criticizing him by saying, you know, let's face it, he hasn't done that much to help. But that's different from saying it's all his fault. Trump did not create the virus. The virus just came. How it got here, who knows? But Trump didn't make the virus. Trump didn't import it to get it in to fuck people up and kill them. But he doesn't know how to deal with it. He doesn't know what to do because he is too proud and too grandiose to ask for help. He knew enough to get Fauci around him and a few people, but basically he can't stand it. So I think that the guy in Facebook, the idea about being a victim is, is related. It's the flip side of, of uh, projecting your own neediness and wanting to get other people to need you. And you just turn it into the fact that other people are attacking you. He turned Peter Alexander into a victimizer. He was not victimizing him. He was turning him into a victimizer, turning his request for help and reassurance for the 10 millions of people who were afraid. He was turning that request into an attack and hearing it as Trump's fault that all these people were sick. That is what a paranoid does. That's what your friend Troy did. It's a paranoid reaction that people have when their grandiosity is challenged. You raised another thing, though. Uh, I don't know if we have how much time we have, but one of the things that's really important that I think you raised is why do these people follow Trump when so many of his policies are destructive to them, why do the farmers follow him? Why do people just follow him and defend him the way this guy did with their lifeblood, essentially? The, there's a couple of reasons, and I can't give them all right now, but one of them is a bit of a digression. Uh, when there was an animal psychologist, of all people, all kinds of fields, named Conrad Lorenz, who wrote a book that I highly recommend, for people who are interested in the psychology stuff, is called uh, King Solomon's Ring. And it's actually a psychological study of various animals that he lived on a farm. He's a very smart guy. But one of the things he understood was that when he would, the, ge the goose would have all these baby geese, he removed the mother for a day and he waddled around like a goose and they all followed him. After that first day, they always followed him no matter what, even when the mother came back. What he called, what we called that process was imprinting, right. psychological right. imprintings for when you're first born. What Trump did, I don't think he did it wittingly because I don't think he knew what he stumbled onto right away. He imprinted on people who were hurting, who were narcissistically vulnerable, who had felt ignored by the government, who had felt that they were down on their luck, who were church-going religious people, who nothing was breaking their way. And he, because of his own injury and his own feeling bad as a kid and unloved, he could tap into their defects. So they imprinted on him. And he knew how to do it with this MAGA hats and all the music and all this dramatic stuff. So he was giving them narcissistic supplies just how we were coming full circle in this hour. He was giving them narcissistic supplies that he needed back from them. But the narcissistic supplies attached them to him in such a profound way that they were imprinted on him. They're still imprinted on him. They will follow him anywhere. It doesn't matter what he says. They will defend him if he is attacked. They love him. It's not just, it is called, some people call it blind faith. I, I, you can call it that. I find it profound imprinting that is so deep, there's no way to dissuade those people. There just isn't. Unless Trump himself came out and said, you people are a bunch of assholes, then maybe half of them might get upset. But even then, I don't think all of them would because they wouldn't believe him. Yeah. And, and race, racism is a, a very key thread to that imprinting yes. you described. Yes. Because of the people who have been there, are 
they feel taken advantage of. The swamp is the rich people, but because Trump talks with a with a Bronx accent, he doesn't sound rich, even though he is. And then all of the racist stuff, because they're feeling passed by by affirmative action, all these Mexican immigrants are coming in. I mean, he started his campaign as a racist attack on uh, Mex on brown people coming in over the border, rapists and criminals and all that stuff. He, the racism reinforces the victim theory. Uh, so he is not only feeding them narcissistic supplies, he's saying, I understand that you're a victim and I'm a victim too. You're a victim of these immigrants. I'm a victim of the press. The press are the enemy of the people. The immigrants are the enemy of you. We're and, both and, besieged by these enemies, and we have to stick together, and, and I will help you. And, Dr. Frank, we see that this cult behavior is potentially fatal. There's a couple yes. in the Southwest who had heard the president talk about uh, uh, hydrochloroquine. Uh, yeah, hydrochloroquine, yeah. And, and the uh, person died. Well, they, they got what was a compound that's intended to clean aquariums. And because they read on the label that it had hydrochloroquine, uh, they thought it would be okay. And the husband yeah. died, and the woman is now an evangelist saying, uh, well, gosh, don't believe anything he says. But it, it's hard to imagine that the well, rest— look what of, it took. Right, but, but I, I think— it. it took a death. But I think most believe. people will just say, oh, you know, he's an idiot, and their loyalty to Trump will not be uh, reduced in any way. That's exactly right. Now, there's another group of people, but I don't want to go into those people, but some of them are my friends who like Trump, and they do it for the money. They will say they like his policies. I'll say, what policies? Yeah. But then they say they really like the tax thing, and uh, they're made a lot of money, these guys. Mm -hmm. um, of friends I know. I mean, it's hard to talk to them. I don't talk to them very often, but they were friends of mine for years that I've known, and they, they are really, they made a ton of money from him. Um, so that's another thing. But I don't think that – I said to one of them, I said, have you ever been to one of his rallies? He says, no, I'm too much of a misanthrope to go to any rally. <laughs> and that's true. <laughs> He's a funny guy. But <laughs> but at the same time, you know, and I love him and he's a dear friend. But it's really something. People are just stuck. But the people who will follow him off a cliff – are the people I'm talking about. They imprinted on him. They will follow him the way those little geese followed uh, Dr. Lorenz in the 1950s or whenever he was doing his experiments. In, in the Facebook post, uh, I referenced that a relative of my partner uh, is in ICU. He has tested positive. He is near death. Uh, the of vent yours. Yeah, the ventilator is, is working oh at, at between 90 and 100%. And a, a relative who's in the same uh, family tree, uh, who is a big Trump supporter, I texted him and I said, are you ready to, uh, you know, uh, repudiate Trump? And his reply was, no, nuke China. Exactly. <laughs> Doesn't surprise me. Let's just nuke them. And then if the virus comes, it's still their fault. Yeah. It is not. We're not talking about rational. Imprinting is not rational. I mean, why would a goose imprint on a human <laughs> except he waddled around for a day when they were babies? The next day, the mother comes and they're not interested. That means something. That We are primitive people. And I think that Trump tapped into primitive injuries and hurts that people felt that involved race, hatred, vulnerability. Some of them felt very good people and they do their best in life, but they're just not making it and they're bitter and hurt. And he says, the swamp is bad. Hillary's bad. We got to lock her up. Everybody in D.C. is bad. We're going to clean the swamp and drain it. And we're going to make sure there's no black and brown people coming in. How bad can it be? <laughs> Uh, it's very, I, I it's very to, upsetting. I wanted to ask you if you have any comment, because uh, before we started recording, 
I mentioned that I occasionally watch Larry David's show, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah. And he does one cringe-worthy or cringe-inducing scene after another. And, you know, during the half hour, it just builds to the point oh, where you say, God. you know, God, what else will he think of next? But in the end, we know that Larry David made all this shit up. And right. that, that he does it to push our buttons and to does, yes. to uh, point out in a satirical way uh, human behavior in the current day. But Trump right. does a lot of Larry David-style things, uh, and he's serious about them. They are a deep That's reflection right. of, of his attitudes and his angst. Uh, and I just wonder what that comparison means to you. Well, I think that that's my wife could not watch Larry David for eight years because he reminded her too much of the people she knew, some of the people she knew at work, who were very much like Larry David and like Trump. They were not self-aware. I mean, Larry David's not self-aware except he makes it up and he's very funny. But you have to be distanced from that because the people he's mocking have no self-awareness. All the people who Larry David teases and says these stupid things to some of them get angry but they all come back they all love him and, and of course he wrote that part too but they all <laughs> rebound and they all you know and yet he's a jerky guy i mean the thing he did yes yesterday on the one i saw where the, he asked what color do you want there was a interracial couple and he says what color would you like your baby to be yeah how tan do you want it i mean it was an unbelievable question well and it started a fight between the white wife and the black it's husband Yes, it did. It was very funny to me, but it was cringeworthy. Well, you know, I turned it off at that point. I had actually maxed out, and it may have been the last scene in the show, but I, I just said, okay, Larry, you got me. He did it. No, he really, I think he does that with people, whereas Trump is not like that. Trump's A is not funny. B, he says very crude things, but he means them like when he says, you're not a reporter. You're a disgrace. That's Larry David doesn't do that. He does, in fact, Larry David's humor is often at his own expense yeah. because you feel like what a schlumpf he is. <laughs> he's not only nasty, he's dumbly, he, you know, you laugh at him, too, because you can't believe somebody says these stupid things. Whereas Trump is overtly hostile, overtly destructive. I, one of the chapters in my book is about his inner conflict between being a builder and a destroyer. And the destroyer part of his personality has been in the ascendancy for his entire presidency. Now, can you translate for the Goyam? I know what a schmuck is, but what was that term you used? A schlum? Schlumiel? No, it wasn't it... schlumiel. What did you call Larry David? A <laughs> uh, schlump? I don't know what. Yeah, schlump. What is what is that? A schlump is like a, a guy who's just a sad sack who can't really do anything right. Okay. And he's always putting his foot in his mouth and saying the wrong thing. I thought that was a, a schmuck, schlub. A schmuck is has more than one meaning. A schmuck can be a jerk, but a schmuck can also be a prick, because right. it originally means prick. Yeah. So the difference is being comfortable being a schmuck versus being comfortable having a schmuck. <laughs> <laughs> and Larry David, in the long run, is comfortable with both. And Trump it, is only Trump is just not. He just can't do it. And in Austria, a schmuck is a jeweler. And a schmuck is a jeweler in Austria. <laughs> yeah. And in uh, L.A., Schmuckers was a, ju uh, a, a jam. They made. Uh, uh, I used to get Schmuckers jam and yeah. jelly. Yeah, I, I think it's still made, but I don't know. Uh, no. Doctor, we're at the end of our 50-minute hour here, and okay. I, I wanted to just wrap up by asking you for a little advice for people who aren't used to being cooped up in the house with uh, the entire family or even just with one other person and the tensions and the stress uh, that can develop uh, through extensive confinement. It's very hard. First of all, the one there's a couple of thoughts. One is... I think it's useful to try to differentiate the concept social distancing, which I have trouble with, from physical distancing. That you need to have physical distance, but that doesn't mean you can't love and be affectionate at a physical distance. That's the first thing. So it shouldn't be called, in my view, social distancing. The second thing is that um, people can find 
ways to reach out because it's not exactly social distancing. They can talk on the phone. They can do Skyping. They can. I know people who have Zoom groups. Mm -hmm. I know people I have several people I know have had dinner parties together on Facebook or on TV somehow. I don't know how to do all that stuff, <laughs> um, but they do. And and um, there's lots of stuff. I mean, I'm very intimate as a psychoanalyst with my patients and I've still and I miss seeing them in the room and they miss seeing me in the room. But I have to say that we can talk very closely and intimately about deep things Um remotely with Skype and with uh, FaceTime. The third thing is that people can find ways to uh, find new things to think about that they really like, whether it's music. I know several people who have started to draw. I know people who are taking online art courses out of the blue. They never drew before. People are taking online all kinds of different courses. If you have a f computer and then people's relationships, um, there's something shared. It's not only that you're at odds if you're just two of you in the room. It's also that you're sharing uh, something that you're trying to help society about. And having that idea, I think, is a useful one to remind yourself of and to remind yourself that you're trying to do a good thing and that there is no cure for this, but you can really try hard and do good things. And then finally, I would turn off the news. I would turn off all MSNBC and all that stuff because it's going to make you crazy. I have one patient who said she reads the news at night, at the end of the day, and then she can't go to sleep. So I'm saying, don't read the news or read it in the morning so at least you can be up. But that's it. Well, for my part, I've stopped watching his news conferences, and I'm Terrible. grateful that some of the networks have uh, started to cut him off. They're cutting him off, and I think they need to do more more. It's very hard to do because he is the president, and what he says, he's a powerful guy. But you have to learn to say not paying attention to him. Now, that also undermines his narcissistic supply. Well, let's let's see what we can do to cut it off entirely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Dr. Justin A. Frank, I always enjoy our conversations. I want to highly recommend your book, Trump on the Couch, Thanks. Inside the Mind of the President. And uh, if you just go to uh, Amazon and look at the cover art, uh, you'll want to buy the book right away. Yeah, and I am, uh, I am sending a copy to my brother and his family in Chicago, uh, they put a, put out a request for uh, tips on books and movies and stuff like that. So I put a care package together, and uh, they'll be passing it around. And I hope other people will pick up your book as well. One last thing if, before is I think people can get books on tape from their public library. And I, one of the fun things to do is sit with your partner and listen to a story being told. Mm -hmm. It's really nice. It is. And, and on that note, I want to recommend uh, Trevor Noah's audio book. Uh, it's about his whole life growing up in South Africa. And it is a fascinating story uh, that <laughs> I, I've listened to all the way through. And uh, I kind of miss his late night show right now. So it could be yeah. a good substitute for people. Dr. Frank, always a pleasure. Thank you for joining us today. And Thanks. send me a bill. I've got Medicare. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> be well. Thanks for listening to this in-depth interview with Dr. Justin A. Frank. Send your comments to Peter at PeterBCollins.com. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling under.